Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is the Church, the Church of Jesus Christ. And in recent programs, we've been studying Bible words that tell us about the Church. We've seen that we are ecclesia. The Church is the gathering of God's people. It means we're in relationship with Jesus Christ through faith in Him and also in relationship with each other. We've also seen that we are the fellowship. And the Bible word for this is koinonia, which means fellowship, partnership, those who share together in Christ with the common purpose of bringing Him glory. But we also notice that the New Testament uses several picture words, words that describe the church, tell us about the church, tell us that we're in it together, and describe our work and function as the Church of Jesus Christ. We are His people, called together to be a people. We are His body, the body of Christ on this earth. We are also His building. In other words, we are those who are the habitation of God. He dwells within us and He fills our lives. Now we're going to move forward to have a look on more teaching about the Church of Jesus Christ. Hello and welcome to this Sword of the Spirit teaching series on glory in the church. We're about halfway through the teaching series now and we're coming to look at today three very difficult questions. How the church relates to the kingdom, number one. How the church relates to Israel, number two. And how the church relates to the state. Church and kingdom, church and Israel, and church and state. I don't know why I put the three tough questions in one session, but here we go. The church and the kingdom. Now you will remember, of course, with the Sword of the Spirit series, The Rule of God, I spent a great deal of time teaching there on the kingdom of God. I won't go through that material now. I've re reproduced some of it for you in your manual here so that you can have a complete teaching on this. But let me remind you of some of the principles of the kingdom. First of all, the kingdom is God's rule. It doesn't refer to a realm a geographical area so much as God's dynamic rule. Jesus told the story of a nobleman who went to a far country to receive a kingdom and then came back and they said, we will not have this man rule over us. And this actually is an historical situation of a man who went to Rome to receive authority, to rule and become a governor. And so the kingdom there, to receive a kingdom, means to receive a right to rule. When we understand then that the kingdom has come in the person of Jesus Christ, it is his ruling authority that is expressed. And when we submit to the king, we become part of the kingdom. We submit to his rule, to his authority. It means that we obey him, we follow him, and we honor him. And uh, this then shows that the kingdom can come even when it's not so obvious and visible. You remember that was the big problem that they had with Jesus' ministry. Perhaps even John the Baptist suffered from this when he said to his disciples, go and speak to Jesus and say, is he really the one who's to come or should I be looking for somebody else? Now why was G J John doubting? Doubtless he was there in prison and maybe going through a depressive period, but he also realized that Jesus wasn't conforming to his ideas of messiahship. And uh, so Jesus said, tell John this, what you see and what you hear, the blind receive their sight, the dead are being raised, the gospel is being preached to the poor, and don't be offended on account of me. Showing then that the kingdom of God and the ruling authority of God can be manifested in various ways and stages that are not full in their own way. And so Jesus speaks about the kingdom that is present in his life and in his ministry. And then he also speaks about the kingdom that is yet to come because he says, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. So we understand that the ruling power of God, the kingdom of God, is working in two ways. It's working in its present form, which is where we are involved as the church of Jesus Christ, and also 
it will come in a future manifestation. So the kingdom is both now and not yet. And so all that teaching is here for you in these opening pages on the manual. So we remind ourselves that the kingdom belongs to God. It's an ongoing activity of God. We remind ourselves it's dynamic and powerful. The kingdom is, is not a temporary experiment. It's the permanent, increasingly powerful manifestation of God's rule on the earth. It's established by Jesus. It's for salvation. If you need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God, if you're not in the kingdom, you're not saved. If you don't know Jesus as king, you're not in the kingdom. It's for salvation. Forgiveness of sins is the greatest miracle of the kingdom. But Jesus' signs and wonders of the kingdom demonstrated its reality and presence. And so, we see the kingdom of God is the, one of the central themes. In fact, Jesus spoke more on the kingdom of God than on anything else. And the kingdom theme runs throughout the whole of the New Testament, speaking about its present and future elements, the opposition that comes to those who are in the kingdom, salvation that happens to those who are in the kingdom, the inheritance of those who are in the kingdom, the word of the kingdom, the grace of God, all of these things are linked to the kingdom of God. And so, I'm bringing this back to your attention so that we can now begin to compare the kingdom with the church. Now, one of the errors that has been made, and uh, it's probably unfair of me to, to mention it quite like this because I would need to spend more time on it fully to justify this, but Augustine, the great architect of modern theology, who actually is owned as the father of theology both for the Protestant churches and the Roman Catholic Church. But that man, Augustine, wrote a book called The City of God in which he identified the church with the kingdom. It was a big mistake and something that we're still suffering from today and living with the consequences of that. For the New Testament shows that the kingdom of God and the church of God are two different things. There's a relationship between the two. They're not unconnected, but you can't say the church is the kingdom, and you can't say the kingdom is the church. I've already showed you that the kingdom is God's dynamic rule, and when you submit to the king, you become part of the kingdom. So, but on the other hand, the church is not the kingdom. The church is called to witness to the kingdom, but the church can never become the rule of God itself. We, in the church, submit to the rule. So there's a strong connection between the two. I would define it like this. The church is the community of the kingdom. We know that the church is the gathering of all people who belong to Christ, those alive on earth and those who are already with him in heaven. Whereas the kingdom describes the whole activity of God in Christ in the world. And so that's a a connection there, but we can see a distinction as well. The church is those who are believers in Jesus, whereas God's kingdom is everything that he does that to demonstrate his dynamic rule in the world. Christ is central to the kingdom, and Christ is central to the church. However, when we speak of the church, our attention is drawn to the results and activity of the kingdom. You understand that? So where God moves in kingdom power, the church comes. So the church is the result of God's kingdom activity. The kingdom causes us to focus on God personally. The church shows us the activity of God. Now the church, is, of course, is the fellowship of those who have heard this call and have believed the gospel of the kingdom. So, you know, to believe the gospel means to believe the kingdom and believe the gospel of the kingdom. To participate in salvation means you are participating in the kingdom of God. So these things are connected. However, the kingdom does not take, uh, rather, the kingdom is not to be identified with the church. We understand that the kingdom does take its visible form in the church. To see the church in one sense is to see the kingdom. To see the church is to see God's kingdom at work. Yes, but the two are not identified. Okay, we are called to demonstrate the kingdom of God in the church. 
We're called to do this through God's words, His works, signs and wonders. We're demonstrating the kingdom by what we do and how we live. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. So we are reflecting God's kingdom into the world. And so as such, the church is the tool, the channel, the channel of influence of the kingdom. We carry out the kingdom activities by living under the rule of God. Now to summarize this, the church means those who live under the rule of God, but we can never become the rule of God. We're called to keep his rule, but we do not become his rule. The kingdom is his rule. Now those concepts are very important for us to, to see the differences and to see how they're related, because many errors have crept into the church through confusing the church and the kingdom. So, for example, we say the kingdom has come. Christ is king. He's as much a king where the church is weak as where the church is strong. You don't measure the kingdom by the church. And just because there's a weak church in one area, it doesn't mean to say God's kingdom is missing. God's power is not diminished. Of course, it's not an ideal situation. We want to see the church fully uh, demonstrate the kingdom. But we point to the kingdom of God. Also, as soon as you start talking about the church being a kingdom, it opens the way for people to confuse earthly kingdoms with the church. And this confusion has entered in, which is my principal objection to the confusion. And we find time and time again where church and kingdom are not distinguished, then we find people trying to use worldly governmental powers to institute church. And that's exactly what happened. It was there in the Middle Ages. It was there through Augustine's work. It was there in, uh, in Calvinism and much of the Reformed approach to things. And we have got to understand the difference between the two. I'm not saying Calvin has, uh, uh, confused the church and the kingdom. I'm saying the way in which it was expressed uh, in many of the Reformed nations has left us with a huge problem, as we'll see in a moment, between the relationship between the church and the state. So this means that in the church we are called to preach the kingdom, to pray for the kingdom to come in glory, always to be directed by the kingdom, but we can never become the kingdom. The early believers urged people to submit to the king. They didn't urge people to join the church. So when you, when you confuse the church and the kingdom, you're going to start pre preaching the church. Come and join the church. No, we don't preach that. We say submit to the king. But in submitting to the king and in belonging to him, you enter the kingdom and you belong to one another. Another major way in which we must uh, distinguish church from kingdom and how kingdom thinking helps us in growing church and seeing church happen, is that when you focus on kingdom, on the reign of God, you're going to be liberated from a preoccupation with our church, our congregation, our vision, our denomination, our tradition. Thank God we are kingdom people. We think of the wider picture. Being kingdom-orientated helps you free from the shackles also of the independent local church approach, which says, listen, this is all that matters, what we're doing here. And you say, no, it's not. There's a wider body of Christ out there. We are kingdom people. We want to see God's kingdom come and God's kingdom extended through the church. So we open our hearts to everything that God's doing. Now, in reality, the early church emphasis on citywide networks, as I've been sharing with you in this series, of interdependent community churches is only a, is only a practical possibility when we as believers and church leaders are concerned far more about kingdom than our church. And this is what we need to be exhibited here in our London City Church Network. Our slogan is, One Church, Many Churches, so that the London City Church can be a witness to the City Church principle here in London. 
one church. So when we plant churches, those churches function as churches, household churches, but there's only one body related to the London City Church. That's the London City Church body. Now, we do that understanding that's our contribution in the kingdom to the body of Christ here in London, of which we are but a part. So there it is, the relationship between the church and the kingdom, the kingdom of God. They're not the same, they're related. Jesus comes as king, we submit to the king, and then become part of the church because we're submitted to the king. But the church never becomes the kingdom. We are called to witness to the kingdom, to demonstrate the kingdom, to pray that the kingdom will come, to see the kingdom come. But the church and the kingdom are different. Now we're going to move on to the next thorny question of the relationship between the church, the kingdom, and Israel. Now, we know that in Old Testament times, God used the people of Israel to reveal his glory to the world, and in that sense, to establish his rule in, on the earth. We know that, strictly speaking, God's kingdom did not come truly until Jesus came. That's why Jesus, when he announced the gospel, he said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is here. In the Old Testament, the prophets were talking about the coming of the kingdom. But in a, another sense, the kingdom of God was already prefigured and in some sense experienced, perhaps even through the theocracy of the Old Testament. That's the rule of God over the nation of God. And the earthly king, David or whoever, had to were ruling on behalf of God. And that's why... Jesus is called the son of David. That's why the Messiah picture, it draws on the picture of the kings of the Old Testament. That's why Jesus is called the king of Israel. The Messiah is the king of Israel. So these Old Testament kings in the kingdom, in the kingdom period in the Old Testament, these kings were themselves pointing towards the coming king, Jesus Christ, and the kingdom. We know, however, that when Jesus announced the kingdom, that uh, many people uh, brought excessive political ideas into that and thought that God's kingdom would have to come automatically in the political realm. And there was a confusion there. We also know that most people uh, in Israel rejected God's ruler when he came in person. When Jesus came in person, most of Israel rejected him. Now, this is the beginning of the problem. Because if most of the Jewish people have rejected Jesus as Messiah, where do they stand in relation to God? Do they continue to be God's people? Does God now have two sets of people on the earth? His earthly people and his not yet quite but soon to be heavenly people? So there's a lot of confusion and questions about this. Now, we also know that God's kingdom continued in Christ. And whereas Israel largely rejected God's kingdom in Christ, we, as members of the body of Christ, the church, we have accepted that kingdom. So where does that leave us in relation to the nation of Israel? These questions are important questions. Now the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 9 through to, verse, to chapter 11, teaches about Israel. And we can't look at all these chapters in detail now. In fact, I've given you just a small taste of this in the manual. It really is a whole subject on its own. But it's quite clear from these chapters that God has not finished with Israel. Just because Israel has rejected Christ, God has not finished with Israel. God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. And by the way, the easiest way to understand this, every time the Bible says Israel, the Bible means Israel. It's as simple as that. Don't try to spiritualize it and get confused. God says what he means. When he says Israel, he means Israel. When he speaks about Jews, he means Jews. All right? Very simple. That's very simple. It's not a complicated matter. It's only complicated when we complicate it. 
God has not yet finished with the nation of Israel. Just because the nation of Israel has rejected Christ, it doesn't mean to say that God has finished with Israel. But it is also very clear in Romans 9 through to chapter 11 that God's way of extending his rule on earth is now through the church rather than the nation of Israel. In other words, we don't all have to go to Israel and to submit to the prime minister or the would-be king of Israel in order to be part of the kingdom of God. No, the kingdom of God is extended through the church. So we have to balance these two things first of all. Number one, God has not yet finished with the nation of Israel. He still has a plan and purpose for that nation. But number two, we must balance that against the fact that God's kingdom on earth is being extended through the church, not through the nation of Israel. Now, throughout our series, uh, in every one of them, I've tried to show that uh, uh, every teaching about the church in the New Testament has its roots with God's dealings with Israel in the Old Testament. Now, having said that, many teachers and Bible believers disagree amongst themselves, sometimes strongly disagree about the precise relationship between Israel and the church. And this affects how they apply Old Testament teaching to the church. But if we want to understand the scriptures on this matter, we've got to test the opinions and positions of people to see if they are using the biblical imagery correctly, to check out whether uh, they have a good overview of the, all that the Bible says, rather than just basing everything on a few isolated verses. I've tried to simplify this for you in the manual, and I share with you two common ways and there are different ways in which believers hold to the relationship between Israel and the church. First of all, some Bible teachers say, and some believers recognize or reckon, that the church and Israel are the same. That's what they believe. They say Israel and the church are to be fully identified. And uh, they say there's one overarching covenant which flows through the story of God's dealings with his people, we see this in the Old Testament in Israel. We see it in the New Testament in the church. So that the Old Testament, God's people, the church, was the nation of Israel. The New Testament church is made up of Jew and Gentile. In the New Testament, we have that manifestation of the church. And so the implication here is the church has replaced Israel. And they'd argue and show that because Israel has rejected Christ, so God says, you're no longer my people. My people now are those who believe in Jesus, and so the nation of Israel is rejected. The covenants are concluded. The law is done away with, and the Old Testament people of God now no longer exist as the people of God. To be, to be a child of God doesn't mean to say you must become a Jew. You must become a believer in Jesus, whether you are Jew or Gentile. Now, let me comment on this. And there is an element of truth about some of this. But we've seen already that Israel is a picture of the church. So Israel in the Old Testament is a picture of the church in the New Testament. There are many parallels. What God says to Israel in the Old Testament can very often be paralleled by what he wants to say to the church in the New Testament. But we must not teach, uh, must not treat rather, the nation of Israel is nothing more than the foreshadowing of the church, as it were, the church in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament. Because there are huge contrasts between Israel in the Old Testament and the church of the New Testament. There are huge, huge contrasts in uh, uh, how God uh, works and how God deals. Of course, it's always by grace and the salvation of Israel and the church. But there are huge contrasts to do with the Mosaic law and the new age of grace in Christ. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I picked that point up in the, in the Rule of God series. Now, those people who identify Israel in the church are often those who will try to apply the Old Testament law to the believers of God in the New Testament. And they become very dog, dogmatic and strong about that. 
And so we have seen, however, that this is inconsistent with New Testament teaching because we're not under law, we're under grace. And there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a, there is a, an agreement. The one is a foundation for the new. But when you build on that foundation, you, neither to, you don't reject the foundation, but neither do you live in the foundation. You don't even live in the basement, let alone the foundation. You live in the building. But the building rests on the foundation. So there has to be a balance here. Then we have others who at the other extreme teach that Israel and the church are totally distinct. They fully separate the two. And they say they're two different entities. And that God has two contrasting purposes and they're two quite separate peoples. God has his earthly peoples and then he has earthly people, then he has his heavenly people. And actually, in some of the extreme forms of this doctrine, in the extreme forms of dispensationalism, which I'm now talking about, they will actually say that God's purpose was only ever through Israel. But what happened was this. When God brought the kingdom to Israel, Israel rejected the king and thereby rejected the kingdom, and God could do nothing more and can do nothing more until they reject the king and the kingdom. And so we have a second plan of God. And this is now the church age. The age of Israel is past. They rejected the king and, and they won't be saved and there's nothing going to happen much there until Jesus returns. But in the meantime, God has offered the kingdom to the nations of the world. And that's the church age. And so we have Israel and the church, two separate things. Now, in a very extreme form of this, some people say that even as faithful Jews, without even believing in Jesus, they are going to be part of God's purposes. They don't even need to believe in Jesus in order to be saved. Because they were saved before Jesus came, the Old Testament believers in God, the Jews, the faithful Jew Jews were saved. And so you can see how this confuses People, what about the cross? Are we suggesting that it is valid now for us to sacrifice and for Jewish people to revive the sacrificial system? Jesus has come. He shed his blood. There surely is no need for any sacrifices. That brings to an end today's teaching on glory in the church. And I pray that you've been blessed as you've been watching today's program and that you've discovered something new and fresh out of the scriptures concerning who we are as the people of God. We'll be back next time for more on Glory in the Church.